Welcome back to the GWJDD Dermatology Translational Science Lecture Series. Uh, I'd like to thank first our industry partners uh, who enable us to do this each time. Uh, and I, of course, would like to welcome our distinguished uh, uh, colleague, collaborator, uh, fellow Washingtonian, uh, Dr. Jeanette Okoya who is Professor of Dermatology, Department Chair, and Program Director, and probably has a bunch of other titles too, uh, at Howard University College of Medicine. Um, she is somewhat of a local girl. She was uh, spent her time at Hopkins, uh, and, and we are very fortunate to have uh, moved her away uh, from the north. Um, just a, a, a personal note, um, you know, I, I first came with Dr. Koye when we were hosting a Hadron Exabertiva Symposium. Uh, we were real excited to get it here, and then I get, no, no, I'm sorry, I can't make it. I'm like, I can't believe it. She's backing out, and she's like, yeah, I broke my back. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. awkward. Um, so we're still friends, which is amazing. Um, uh, but Dr. Goya has really emerged as a, a thought leader in, in the world of hydronic separativa, which we'll be hearing about today. Uh, it's published extensively, and uh, I really, really feel so fortunate to have her uh, really down the street uh, at Howard and, and as a colleague. So thank you, Dr. Goya. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's really an honor to be the first speaker of the year on my home turf. It was weird to hear that I'm a Washingtonian. That's, I, I'm that's still, pretty I'm awesome. I'm not used to it, actually. <laughs> and I did, I did fall and break my back. And I felt bad because I had a whole, you know, I had a whole talk planned. Um, and Is I heard that it was. Talk? No, no, it's a different <laughs> one. It's more updated. So I am going to talk to you today about one of my favorite topics. Uh, Hold on, let me just make sure the slides are working. All right, here we go. So, you know, HS um, is not an easy disease to treat. And uh, our patients are really suffering from this disease. And today, you know, Dr. Friedman asked me to do more of a research-focused talk. So this won't be a comprehensive talk about management of HS, but I will throw in some pearls here and there that are particularly relevant to, to the research that I'll be presenting. Um, but in addition to that, what I'd like you to get out of this talk is a little bit about the pathogenesis of HS and what we know and what we don't know. But also, I would like you to see that this is a little bit of a story of my career thus far. And hopefully, our trainees and our junior faculty will see how a pure clinician can incorporate a research career um, into, incorporate research into your career, and how fun uh, that could be. So this is the list. Um, it's like a compilation of the publications in HS between 1995 and 2015. And you can see how much HS has uh, exploded, both interest, in the clinical uh, care and research in this disease. That star represents around 2009 when I became familiar with HS and interested in it. And I, I put that star there for two reasons. One is to say I was doing clinical investigative work in HS before it was cool. <laughs> and more importantly, uh, that sometimes in an academic career, timing is everything. And so, uh, and, and, and mentorship. So when I was uh, seeing patients at Johns Hopkins Bayview, I was alongside Dr. Jerry Lazarus. So Dr. Lazarus, many of you may not know him, but he is a giant in dermatology. And so he was running the wound care center, and so he saw lots of patients with pyoderma gangrenosum. Therefore, he saw patients with HS. And one day he grabbed me from my clinic, took me over to his clinic, and he introduced me to a patient. She was my age. She was a young black woman, and she had HS and PG, and it was destroying her life. And so he said, look, look at how she's suffering. This could be you. What are you going to do about this? And so that was sort of my charge. Um, he also thought that this was a very interesting disease immunologically, and he predicted that you know, 10 years from now, uh, the in industry and basic science world will be much more interested in it. And he was absolutely right. So, an academic career is never done in, in isolation. So when I think of HS, you know, a cure or even a treatment that works, right, I think it's way down the road, perhaps. And we're on this yellow brick road trying to get there. And you'll see that I've worked and published in many different parts of the pathogenesis and even treatment of this disease. And my hope is that 
uh, hopefully I just put some bricks down for other people uh, to follow. So let's, uh, let's get started. Thank you. So just by way of review, HS is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the hair follicles. It tends to occur in the intertriginous areas and it's part of the follicular occlusion tetrad along with acne conglobata, pilonidal cysts, and dissecting cellulitis of the scalp. And so even though we don't really have a good handle on the true etiology of HS, I think that we can all agree that the primary pathogenic step is probably follicular occlusion. So basically, the hair follicle gets plugged with you know, keratinocytes, sebum, bacteria. The hair follicle dilates below the plug. It sound, sounds very similar to acne. And then once that follicle ruptures, it releases the follicular contents into the dermis, which incites this really robust inflammatory response that our HS patients can't seem to rein in. And so this inflammatory response, it just keeps going and it tunnels through the dermis and connects different follicles to each other and communicates to the surface of the skin. And so that's your sign of tracks. And so patients with, you know, we use the Hurley stage uh, classification system. It's not a perfect system for sure. Um, it doesn't really capture the dynamic nature of HS, but for simplicity's sake, um, in Hurley stage one disease, patients develop nodules, so tender subcutaneous nodules. In stage two disease, you develop sinus tracts. So as long as a patient has one sinus tract, they're considered stage two. And stage three uh, is basically when an entire anatomic area is involved. But the way that I think of HS patients, I have started to do more categorization of them. They come in many different flavors, so to speak. And there was a nice paper from a couple of years ago from a French group, and they finally put down on paper what many of us who've been seeing HS patients over the years have already known. Uh, this may not be the same disease. Um, so one subtype is the axillary mammary inguinal subtype. And I'm paraphrasing some of the, the work from this study. I sort of made some of my own categories. And these patients tend to develop lesions on the uh, breasts, so the submammary area, the intramammary area, the axilla, and the mons pubis and inguinal folds. So usually the front of the body. It's usually women. They're usually overweight and will sometimes have hormonal fluctuations. And then you have the follicular subtype. So we'll talk a little bit more about this subtype uh, in, in a few minutes. But these patients tend to have relatively mild HS but they have lots of other things. They have pilonidal cysts, they have epidermal inclusion cysts, they have very severe acne and really severe scarring from the acne, from comedones, from the EICs, they just make these horrible uh, depressed scars. And they tend to be men uh, and they tend to be smokers. And then there's the dreaded gluteal subtype. So when this patient walks into clinic, my heart drops because these patients have primarily buttock disease. It's usually men, often thin men, often smokers as well. They have long-standing disease and they don't respond well to medical treatment at all. They're also at higher risk for squamous cell carcinoma development. Then you have the syndromic subtype. These are the patients with HSNPG or POSH syndrome or PAPOSH syndrome and they are inherently different. They're different uh, immunologically. They are the patients who I think tend to respond a little bit better to anakinra compared to our you know, regular run of the mill HS patients, but very difficult to get their disease under control. Um, sometimes you have to resort to long-term systemic steroids. And of course, uh, with HS you have the, you know, the acute lesions that you're always dealing with. You have your sinus tracts and drainage and pain that the patients are dealing with, but then down the road, there can be sequelae, uh, just sequelae from the chronic inflammation. So if you have chronic inflammation, um, you can have lymphatic obstruction. And so I've seen patients with lymphangiomas, uh, similar to, to this patient here. I have patients with massive scrotal lymphedema, secondary to their HS. And, you know, and, and as you see some of these side effects, you start seeing that the HS now becomes secondary 
to what they, they're having to deal with. Patients can get keloids um, or uh, really hypertrophic scars that can cause contractures and limit their range of motion. And as I mentioned, squamous cell carcinoma is definitely a potential sequelae of long-term HS, especially um, with disease on the buttocks, more common in men, more common in smokers, and usually after uh, long-term disease. So this patient, this was one of my patients, he had long-term poorly controlled HS for over 25 years. Um, he was a, cig a cigar smoker, actually, um, and this uh, SEC did eventually take his life. We also know now that HS, like psoriasis, is more than skin deep, right? It represents systemic inflammation. These patients are at risk for um, pyoderma gangrenosum, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's in particular, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, depression, anxiety, et cetera. And their quality of life scores are much worse than, than that seen in psoriasis. And so, you know, with the pathogenesis of HS, I used to think of it in this sort of list format. I think we know that hyperkeratinization and follicular occlusion is an issue. We know that the immunity of the patient is an issue, right? They're, they're overreacting to their own follicular contents and their own bacteria, perhaps. And we know that there's a role for genetics, obesity, diet, smoking, and hormonal influences. And I thought we just had to go down this list and do different studies and figure out which of these caused HS. But I think uh, we all, all of us who kind of think about HS a lot, agree now that it's not one or two of those things. It's probably all of them. And different patients hang out in different sectors of this diagram, where they may have uh, some hormonal influences, obesity, and diet contributing to their disease. Or there are patients who are very thin, and they're smokers, and there's something going on with their notch signaling because they have a nicotine mutation. So um, this goes back to my, my comment earlier that maybe this isn't one disease. We're lumping all of these people together because they have this phenotypic similarity, but I think uh, by trying to treat them all the same, we might be missing the mark. So let's move on to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of HS. Uh, I think this uh, was particularly fun because when I started seeing HS patients, I thought that there was an overwhelming number of black patients in my clinic. Well, you know, that could have been because I had an ethnic skin clinic, I was in Baltimore. So I thought that that could be a bias. And when I looked in the literature, I saw that it was said that HS was more common in white patients. And that was because the only study that was done in the US was done in Olmsted County in Minnesota. <laughs> so there was there was one study that I, one paper that I remember from Europe that said that an increased prevalence in black patients is suggested, but has never been studied. So I was like, well, I think I could study that. Right? We could start there. Um, and back then, also in the data, the prevalence estimates were very wide. It was anywhere from one to four percent. The four percent number was uh, from a cohort in Europe. The female pre pre uh, predominance was well known, uh, with ratios as high as five to one. And interestingly, uh, 10 years ago, we really thought that HS um, occurred, or the burden of HS was in people in their 20s. And that's not true. And we'll talk about why that's important in a sec. So I started with just a little survey. Um, I surveyed 40 HS patients who came in to see us in 2011 or so, and 57 controls. And here we saw that more than half of the patients were African-American, but again, that was my clinic, so that certainly was biased. The female to male ratio did pan out three to one. We saw that 70% of our patients were obese. 15% had diabetes, which was concerning to me. And I remember in the literature, we weren't talking about HS and obesity. Well, we were talking about obesity, but we weren't talking about HS and metabolic syndrome yet. So that was a little worrisome. Half of them smoked, and I think it was 75% percent of them were either current or former smokers. And the other thing that really struck me was the 12.5 years was the average time to diagnosis. These patients had been going to dermatologists, primary care doctors, OBGYNs, emergency rooms, surgeons, and no one had ever put a name to what they had. And they all thought that they were the only person in the world who had this. 
And so to try to really get at this um, idea that maybe African-American patients were overrepresented in this disease, we then did a chart review of patients who were seen at Hopkins over uh, two years. There were 381 patients, and that three to one female to male ratio uh, was the same. And we saw that um, the prevalence rates in African-American women was about three times that of the prevalence rate in white women. And when we compared that, because again, this it's Baltimore, right? So there could be a bias there. But when we compared those, the numbers of HS patients to the numbers of patients who saw any given provider at Hopkins for any given diagnosis in that same time period, it was still statistically significant. And so we wrote this up and published it. And when it got accepted, I was like, oh, okay. Am I a researcher? Does that, that make me a researcher? But at, <laughs> it was really exciting because at the time, there was so little out there that every little bit helped. And so this was the first single institution study that maybe suggested in the US that the demographics of HS uh, wasn't quite what we thought it was. Another thing that I noticed um, in clinic was that I was getting called to see um, patients in the hospital more and more often. And the patients who I saw in the hospital were overwhelmingly black, and there were a lot of men that I, I saw as inpatients, much more men on the inpatient side than I did on the outpatient side. So I wanted to see if the demographics of patients who were seen in the hospital for HS were diff was different from the demographics that we see in the ambulatory side. And so we went a little bit bigger. Uh, we did this re retrospective study uh, using the HCUP nationwide inpatient sample. And it's the largest all-payer inpatient claims database um, in the United States. And so we looked at um, about 150,000 HS uh, patient discharges and uh, controls. And basically what we saw was that nationwide, almost half of the patients who are hospitalized for HS are black and that the rates of hospitalizations for HS has been increasing uh, exponentially. And the thing that I was most interested in is this three to one ratio, right, we, we know exists woman to man in HS, but in inpatients, in hospitalized patients, that ratio was much smaller, it's 1.4 to one, which suggests to me that one, men have, may have more severe disease, which I think clinically we know that, uh, but it's not talked about that much. And it's not really well studied, so why that is. Um, or it just could be that men are more likely to go for surgery, or maybe it is that men are more likely to have the gluteal subtype, which responds much better to surgery than it does medical management. But either way, there's something here that one of you should study. The other interesting thing we found in this data set is that the South Atlantic division, where, where we are actually, um, the, the prevalence rate was actually over three times higher than that on the west side of the country, so in the uh, Pacific Midwest, um, the Pacific and, and mountain regions of the country. And when you look at the obesity map of the US, um, it tracks quite well with that. And the other thing we found is that uh, patients from zip codes with the lowest quartile for income accounted for about 40% of the HS hospitalizations. So that suggested to us then that inpatients tended to be poor, black, and um, from our part of the country uh, and nearby and perhaps more likely to be obese. So now, given some of the data that you know, hopefully we contributed, and then all the data that many of my colleagues have been uh, putting into the literature more recently, we now believe that the prevalence estimate for HS in the U.S. is closer to 0.1%. It, um, uh, it, it may still be underrepresented because many patients are still living in secret with this disease and don't seek care for it. The female to male predominance is actually closing, that gap is closing a little bit in the United States. And the prevalence rate is actually higher in people in their 30s. And the reason that's important is because, I don't know, it depends on where you're sitting, but 30 is pretty young, right? And people who are in their 30s are just getting started in their careers. They probably have young children. And to have a disease that's this devastating, I've just witnessed too many divorces, 
you know, job loss, um, disability, and at 30, in your 30s, to, to have 40 more years of life with no income, no spouse, it's just, or with addiction to pain medication, right? This is a very bad disease. The data uh, also confirms now an overrepresentation in African Americans. Um, actually, a nice big national uh, study done by Dr. Garg and his group showed that the prevalence of HS among black patients in the US is two to three times higher than white patients. And now we know that HS is associated with low socioeconomic status. We always knew about the obesity and smoking association. So, so what lessons did I learn from this part of, of my career. I learned that you should trust your clinical instincts, right? So don't always believe the dogma. Don't always believe what's in the textbook. If you are on the ground in the clinic and you see something and you notice, the tre you notice a trend, trust that you know, maybe you saw it and somebody else didn't. And I think it's important if you find a disease that you're interested in, um, whether it's, it's interesting to you on a research side or clinically, or you enjoy working with that patient population, or sometimes these interests are thrust upon you, right? So people call me a hair loss expert. I didn't sign up for that, but <laughs> you know, patients started coming to me, so then I became a hair loss expert. So you, know, you develop expertise, you learned the lived experience of these patients, and just by doing that, you're going to contribute to the specialty and you're going to contribute uh, to advancing the field. So trust your instincts. All right, so let's move on to talk about the genetics of HS. And I'll spend most of the time talking about a nice, um, interesting project that, that we did. So familial HS is actually not necessarily that common. Only a third of HS cases are thought to be uh, truly familial with an autosomal dominant um, inherit inheritance pattern. And these patients tend to have loss of function mutations in the gamma secretase protein, in particular nicotrine, presinolin, and presinolin enhancer to genes. Now, gamma secretase plays an important role in the intramembranous cleavage of notch and amyloid precursor protein. With amyloid precursor protein, uh, that's uh, associated with early onset Alzheimer's, but this is a different portion of the gamma secretase uh, protein we're referring to uh, when it comes to HS. Now, in the skin, notch is expressed in your hair follicles. And when they, um, when they uh, looked at mice who had notch, uh, knockout, knockout mice who didn't have notch signaling, they had follicular hyperkeratosis and epidermal cyst formation pretty similar to uh, the phenotype of our HS patients. So what we think is that you have this loss of function mutation in your gamma secretase gene, whichever subunit, that causes decreased notch signaling, and then you have aberrant follicular hyperkeratinization, follicular occlusion, HS. So when I saw that uh, come out in the literature, I thought it was very interesting. I think the the biggest study was a, a, a Han Chinese family, and I think we did it in Journal Club or something, so it was in the back of my mind. But I had a patient who was extremely ornery, but I won her over, I almost always do. And she became my good friend, and she, we, I saw her very often. And then one day she said, I'm gonna bring my sister to see you, because I think she has what I have. And she brought her sister, and then her sister brought her two daughters. And what was interesting about them, they had innumerable comedones on their face. Their entire face was covered in comedones, and all of them looked the same. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe they have um, a, a mutation, and we should look for it. So I heard that the Institute of Genetic Medicine at Hopkins had some money that they needed to spend down. And so, <laughs> so I just walked up there, and I said, hey, I have, I have a project. This is easy. I have the patients. Let's do it. And so they, they agreed to help. So we identified four affected generations. There were eight family members with HS. Five of them lived in Baltimore and all agreed to participate, which was really nice. And then there were four family members who were unaffected by HS, and two of them agreed to participate. And there were eight other um, family members, but they were all children, so the, they hadn't hit puberty yet for us to see whether or not they would manifest the phenotype. And so we found a nicotrine 
mutation, a nonsense mutation in this family. All five of the affected uh, family members had the mutation. None of the unaffected family members had the mutation. And at that time, there were 17 cases of Nikishin mutations um, identified in HS. Three were nonsense mutations like ours. And there was only one other study in the literature that found a Nikishin mutation in someone of African descent. And this was an Afro-Caribbean uh, patient in, in London. And they had a splice site mutation, not a, not a nonsense mutation. So that was really cool to you know, contribute that to the literature. These are pictures of that family. Um, I promised them that I would never show their faces, but it's so striking, the comedones on their faces. Um, but they have what, what I think is the follicular subtype of HS. So you can see on this person's back, just the innumerable comedones, multiple open comedones that you can see here, and lots of epidermal inclusion cysts. And these are scars from uh, H removal of HS lesions and, and epidermal inclusion cysts. But relatively mild HS. And so I wonder if um, this follicular subtype could be a marker for these gamma secretase mutations. So you know, look out for those patients um, and, and see if, if, uh, if maybe I might be right. But these patients have HS in the typical HS locations, but they also have HS on the posterior scalp, the chest, the back, even the thighs. And they have epidermal cysts, pilonidal cysts, comedones, and severe acne. And this is just, uh, the, I just brought back the picture of the patient with the follicular um, subtype. And he had severe acne conglomerata and left, it left behind these um, terrible scars. And he had you know, HS-like nodules on the occipital scalp as well. This is a patient I saw um, recently here in DC who I think has this follicular subtype. Again, lots of comedones on the face, not as much as my, my original family, but you could see she has these two large epidermal inclusion cysts on her face. Uh, and, and she uh, is a smoker, and actually many of the family members um, were smokers as well. Smoking affects notch signaling. So we can imagine they're getting a double whammy if you have this mutation and you smoke, um, then I think the phenotype uh, becomes much more expressed. So just some treatment pearls for patients with this particular subtype, which hopefully now you'll be thinking about it as you see uh, HS patients. So again, their HS is relatively mild. Of course, they don't think so. I need to be careful not to say it that way. Oh, your, your HS is mild. It's not mild to them. Um, one nodule that makes you unable to put your arm down you know, for three weeks uh, is, is they, they don't want to hear that other people have worse HS. But so they might have, you know, a nodule here and there, but they have this widespread involvement of other things that could be relatively disfiguring. Um, I like to use oral and topical retinoids in this particular patient group. I think it can help the appearance of the comedones. Uh, it can make them easier to extract. And I treat their acne very aggressively. So isotretinoin. And some of my patients, especially uh, the men, I will leave them on isotretinoin, low dose, 10, 20, 40 milligrams a day for you know, the foreseeable future. Uh, it doesn't help their HS, but it helps the acne and sometimes the comedones. Smoking cessation is important for all our patients, especially our HS patients, but especially this subtype and the gluteal subtype, because I think the gluteal subtype, they're at risk for SCC, and smoking makes that worse. But this subtype, they really uh, shouldn't smoke. It makes their HS that much worse. And I would resist the urge to remove their epidermal inclusion cysts. I think they just get um, a lot of scars all over their body from us removing these. So if they're in a cosmetically sensitive area or they really just want it gone, then sure. But otherwise, I wouldn't necessarily go after them. So there have been some recent um, advances in the genetics of HS that I'll share with you briefly. So now we have over 30 known mutations in uh, patients uh, with HS um, in the gamma secretase complex. But there's more and more interest in the nicotrin mutation, which is the one we found in, in, in our family. And actually, they're wondering if the nicotrin mutation might actually be important in sporadic disease. 
So that's, that's going to be interesting as we delve into that. And we know now that, you know, negative mutations impair uh, differentiation and maturation of hair follicles. But now there's data to suggest that it also does that for keratinocytes through your notch signaling pathway. But what's really interesting to me is that they're starting to believe that notch, that the Nikistri mutation doesn't actually exert its pathogenic effect through notch signaling, meaning follicular occlusion, but actually through its effects on the inflammatory cascade. So um, they're seeing an increased type 1 interference signature, increased NF kappa B signaling in keratinocytes in patients with this mutation. So it may not be just follicular occlusion anymore. It may be that this mutation changes the inflammatory milieu. But again, this gets back to this idea of HS is probably different diseases, right? So for example, the PSEN, the presinolin mutation, um, if patient has a mutation that leads to overexpression of PSEN1, it can actually increase and prolong TNF alpha production in response to LPS stimulation, right? So imagine you have a patient, we have two patients, they have HS, they look the same. But one of them has a PSEN mutation, one has a Nicotrin mutation. If you treat with TNF alpha inhibitors, the patient with a PSEN mutation might actually improve. But someone with a Nicotrin mutation who has NF kappa B signaling, you know, TNF alpha and IL-1 can actually trigger the NF kappa B uh, pathway. So yes, you may block TNF alpha but their NF kappa B signaling is already overactive. So the TNF alpha inhibitor is not going to necessarily work in those patients. So I think in the end, this might be the way that we can tease out uh, who gets which drug, uh, personalized medicine. So lessons learned from this little section. Collaborate. Get out of your clinic. Get out of your specialty. You know, go to OBGYN Grand Rounds every now and then. You never know who you'll meet. You never know what you'll learn. And this project would not have been possible without the Institute of Genetic Medicine being willing to work with us. Again, I say trust your clinical instincts. This was a trend. It was as simple as that. Um, and ask yourself questions. Why is this happening? Does anybody know why this is happening? Probably nobody else has seen it. And you can launch an entire career that way. And moreover, be good to your patients. So this study was built on a relationship. And the fact that a black family in Baltimore was willing to do a genetic study at Hopkins says a lot. And it was only because they trusted me um, and believed that um, I had their interests at heart. So be good to your patients. So we'll finish up on uh, the role of bacteria and antimicrobials. Um, in HS. So we believe that HS is not primarily an infectious process, uh, but this is still hotly debated. Um, but perhaps bacteria are involved early in the pathogenesis of disease. So again, maybe you're having this aberrant response to common cell bacteria that are in the hair follicle, or maybe the skin microbiome or the gut microbiome are um, unbalanced and leads to HS. Or maybe bacteria are involved later in the pathogenesis of disease. So you have this structurally abnormal tissue, so maybe it's becoming secondarily infected. We know that biofilms have been found in chronic HS lesions in the sinus tracts. So we, we really don't know. But I think, again, somebody's journal club I was sitting in on, and I saw that um, obesity has been linked with an increase in bacteria from the firmicutes phylum in the gut. And so I wondered if maybe that phylum was overrepresented in HS patients since they tended to be obese. I didn't have um, the ability to test the gut microbiome, but I had retrospective data from bacterial cultures of my HS patients, because for a couple years I was culturing everybody, because I was pretty sure bacteria had something to do with this. Um, and so we did this cross-sectional analysis of uh, over 600 HS patients that were seen over um, over a few years uh, at Hopkins, about almost half of them had bacterial culture data at some point over their, their um, treatment uh, there. And we looked at the, the first ever recorded bacterial culture that the patient had and compared the results between obese and non-obese patients. And we saw that indeed, firmicutes, the firmicutes phylum was overrepresented in HS patients. 
and more importantly, uh, Staph aureus, Enterococcus, and Proteus species were more likely to grow in obese HS patients compared to non-obese HS patients. And since then, um, you know, more and more people are working on the skin and hopefully soon the gut microbiome in HS. And this was a nice paper that came out just a, a year or two ago uh, where they looked um, at the microbiome in HS um, for patients in Denmark. And thankfully, they were able to use 16S and 18S ribosomal RNA, which is, of course, uh, a much uh, better way of looking at this compared to just bacterial swabs. But again, that paper was published because nobody else had done it, right? So uh, I couldn't get that published now, but um, I'm glad that we're making progress. And so they uh, took biopsies from lesional skin of HS patients, perilesional skin, and uh, controls who were unaffected. But importantly, the controls only had biopsies taken from their axilla, and that's, uh, that'll become important in a, in a second. So um, in contrast to what we found in our small study, they actually didn't find any difference between the microbiome in patients based on BMI or even severity of disease, which I thought was interesting. What they found, though, is that in non-lesional skin, in patients with HS, there was actually more diversity compared to lesional skin and even compared to healthy controls. So they're hypothesizing that the skin, the, um, the imbalance in the skin microbiome happens first, and then HS happens after. I don't know. I think much more work has to be done here. This, of course, was a fully Caucasian population in Europe. I don't know if this data is generalizable to the US population, um, but their data was interesting. So Corynebacterium and these two guys that I had never heard of before I read this pa paper, Porphyromonas and Peptonifilus species, they were the most abundant species identified in HS lesions. Notably, P. acnes, or no Porphyromonas species, were found in HS lesions. So, who knows, maybe P. acnes is, or Porphyromonas species in general, are they protective against HS? Maybe. The most abundant species that they identified in healthy controls was F uh, Staph epidermidis and P. acnes, and the two species that were seen in HS lesions were never seen in the healthy controls. But who are they, and why haven't we heard of them? Well, these two species are not easily grown in you know, regular culture. The first, Porphyromonas, is a gram-negative anaerobic rod that uh, lives in the mouth. And it's associated with uh, periodontitis. And I have been wanting to do a study looking at periodontitis and HS for the longest time. So if anybody wants to do that, there's a dental school at Howard. I'm sure we can make it happen. But I need more than 24 hours in a day to do that. Peptonifilis is uh, a gram-positive anaerobic cocci, and that's in the vaginal and gut flora. And it actually causes a host of um, skin and systemic infections. But again, we would never actually grow these in our regular cultures. So we wouldn't have seen them before. So it's possible that they may be part of the pathogenic pathway, but we don't know. This is all still very new. So the lesson I, I learned from this section is that there's definitely more to come on the microbiome story. And the question is, are the microbiome changes in HS part of the pathogenic pathway, or are they just secondary to having these open wounds near to mucosal areas? I don't think we know yet. But I would avoid bacterial cultures in HS in general, unless there's a clinical reason. And so the clinical reasons are, is there evidence of superinfection? Is there evidence of cellulitis? Um, is there a change in the amount or the odor of the drainage? That's when I would culture to see if, if, um, if something's going on. And if you culture and it grows mixed flora, staph species, Corynebacterium species, walk away. And if your culture grows E. coli, Pseudomonas, or Proteus, and there is malodor or copious drainage, then consider a short course of directed antibiotic therapy based on sensitivity, so no more than a couple of weeks. And this is really important because antibiotic resistance is becoming, uh, well, it is a serious issue worldwide. And we know we've been talking about it more with acne, but in HS, it's very important. As I mentioned, I was culturing a lot of patients earlier in my career, and 
I was struck by how many of them were clindamycin resistant. They were growing lots of different bugs, and many of those bugs were clindamycin resistant, and I wondered if I was causing that. Because I was giving clindamycin out like candy. And so I looked at that same cohort of patients, the 632 patients, and we found, uh, looking for antibiotic resistance, and we found that for the patients who were on topical clindamycin at the time of their culture, they were more likely to grow clindamycin resistant Staph aureus. For the patients who were on Cipro at the time of their culture, they were more likely to grow Cipro resistant MRSA. And for patients who were on Bactrim at the time of their culture, they were more likely to grow Proteus species, and those Proteus species were more likely to be Bactrim resistant. Interestingly, in our cohort, there wasn't any resistance noted to tetracyclines or oral clindamycin, which we use a lot. But I think maybe we just weren't uh, powered enough to find it. So this was very concerning to me, and I, it changed my practice. Since then, uh, there have been a couple more studies. This one was from Europe. They looked at 114 bacterial cultures of HS lesions, and the prevalence of antibiotic resistance was pretty startling, right? So about 85% prevalence of uh, resistance to tetracycline, 65% for clindamycin, almost 70% for rifampin. So what did I learn? I would avoid treating patients with HS, with ciprofloxacin, or any of the fluoroquinolones, or Bactrim, unless they're super infected with a sensitive bug, and then you would just do your usual uh, 10 to 14 day course. These antibiotics are not anti-inflammatory, and it breeds resistance to these very important drugs. I would combine topical clindamycin with benzoyl peroxide. I would incorporate bleach baths in an attempt to decrease the risk of um, resistance to clindamycin. However, a recent study just showed that there was no difference in resistance rates with, in patients with HS who used these antimicrobial washes compared to those who didn't. So I don't know that my benzoyl peroxide uh, trick is doing anything. I would stay on the shorter side for courses of tetracycline. I think this data, this, uh, these recommendations have been coming out for acne as well, no more than three months at a time. And then patients can use them for flares as needed for 10 to 14 days. And if the, anti if the tetracyclines are not doing the trick, then you need another modality. If it's not working, if it's not helping at all in three months, it's not going to help in nine months. Now, clindamycin rifampin combination is sort of one of our favorites for HS. It's 300 milligrams twice a day for both of them. Sometimes I use three times a day for clindamycin for some of my larger patients. And uh, in the literature, it said that you could do this for 10 to 12 weeks. That not, not, this was never studied. This is an arbitrary um, amount of time uh, that you can use this for. I would recommend that you use it for less time than this, four to six weeks. Uh, and take the patient off. If they're not getting any benefit, switch to another modality. Because, as you probably remember, rifampin induces the CYP3A4 pathway, which reduces your plasma concentration of clindamycin to essentially nothing by two weeks. The reason we combine clindamycin and rifampin is because you're never supposed to use rifampin alone. It breeds resistance, right? Well, after two weeks, you're effectively giving rifampin monotherapy just based on the CYP uh, system. Rifampin is one of the most important drugs in the treatment of TB worldwide. I know we don't think about that a lot here, um, but uh, we really don't want to contribute to multi-drug resistant TB if we can help it. So just in my last few minutes, you know, I think that I've had this really rewarding early part of my career doing research in HS on the ground, in the clinic, just by asking clinical questions. But it's not an easy disease to study. It's relatively uncommon, and so the way that uh, we tried to get around that is, you know, we started an HS clinic, we did an HS um, support group, and that concentrated the patients um, and increased our exposure to them. We got to learn a little bit more about the disease through the patients, increased their exposure to each other, and then there we were able to give them information about research that we were doing and that others were doing. There's no organized collection of H samples from which our basic science colleagues can study the disease. So we created an HS tissue bank 
at Hopkins, we collect skin, serum, saliva, and then we associate that with the patient's disease characteristics. Um, Angel Bird, uh, she's an MD, PhD uh, from Brown. She came down as my ethnic skin fellow a few years ago. And together we worked on sort of pivoting from the clinic to, to the lab or really kind of translational studies in HS trying to get to the pathogenesis. And so she has built this tissue bank and now she's at Howard with me and continuing to do this work. There's no animal model for HS and so Angel and her group, they have uh, tried an HS xenograft mouse model. And so that paper is coming out any day now. And there are multiple phenotypes, as I mentioned. So we don't know if they're the same disease and we're kind of just treating them all the same. So I think that may be one of the first things we need to do is to separate them and study them separately so that we could come up with uh, treatments that work for, for our different patients. But I think overall, the HS patient population, they're really resilient, they're grateful, and they're interested in participating in research because they really feel like they don't have many options. The HS um, group, the, the people around the world who study this disease and take care of patients are pretty collaborative. And of course, there's growing basic science and growing industry interest in HS, which has helped with funding. Um, and now there's an NIH um, grant just for HS, which is amazing. And so Dr. Bird is going to continue um, to take uh, our work down this translational and basic science um, path. Um, she recently looked at the role of macrophages in the collagen deposition of HS, because I think, sure, the acute um, lesions of HS are problematic to patients, but in the end, it's the chronic lesions, it's the fibrosis, the sinus tracts that cause a lot of the problems. So uh, we're really interested in um, how that fibrosis is forming and when, and could we intervene early to, to, to decrease the impact of that. And then this is just a sneak peek of her HS xenograft mouse model. So she basically took HS tissue and transplanted it onto an immunodeficient mouse. And it's just interesting, the HS nodules went away and the skin became deep pigmented. The overlying skin became deep pigmented. We have no idea what any of this means, but it was the first time anybody had ever attempted something like this. So I think there were some lessons that we learned from the process. Um, and I don't think that this will be the model for HS. Uh, but we're working on some others as well. And so, you know, I couldn't do any of this without my HS patients. They love me and I love them, most of them. Um, and uh, the, the Hopkins Department of Dermatology. And on the right side here, these were all medical students, residents, or fellows, without whom none of these studies would have actually come to fruition. Um, so. I have all of them to, to thank, and all of them are now dermatologists, so that's fun. And so thank you all for your attention. <laughs>
I guess, requires money, but only one of those studies was even funded, right? Some of it is just blood, sweat, and tears, and we have lots of students and residents who are willing to put that blood, sweat, and tears to like push things through. They get, it, they get interested in research. They get it on their CVs. So I think we can harness um, all of our resources, and it doesn't always come down to money. So, but yes, let's do it. I have more. Oh, sorry. You alluded to hormonal influences, but you didn't mention anything about uh, hormonal therapy in, in HS. So, well, I, I just, it's, it's pretty fraught uh, for me. I think that there are patients who clinically will have hormonal uh, flares with uh, their menses or they'll flare with pregnancy or the disease will become quiescent with pregnancy. So that's part of my intake. Um, I want to know if that's part of their history. And if it is, then I'm more likely to use hormonal treatments like spironolactone, finasteride, even certain types of OCPs. Um, but I've just not seen a lot of success with those treatments, even in people who have obvious hormonal flares. So I don't think uh, the hormonal aspect is as simple as estrogen, progesterone. It might be androgens. It might be the androgen receptor. Um, you know, sensitivity of the receptor, I, I have no idea, but it's not cut and dry yet. And as part of, as part of your workup, do you do hormonal studies uh, as you might for PCOS? I don't. I don't. Do you? No. Yeah. Unless a patient looks like they have PCOS. Right, right. I just want to piggyback on this. There was a study in JAD recently published by Alexa Kimmel's group looking just at spironolactone as monotherapy, which showed mm -hmm. some benefit. Um, I agree. If you take the approach of, all right, I'm going to try one thing only, see if that works. If it doesn't transition something else, that doesn't work with these patients. You need to dump everything on them. Um, so in, in that sense, you know, tackling from the anti-androgenic standpoint, that makes sense if you're going to then also do the anti-inflammatory too. Um, and that kind of goes into my question to you from a practical standpoint. We have one FDA approved drug for this really complex condition. And so most of what we do is off label. Uh, and there's certainly emerging evidence that other uh, targeted therapies, biologics are useful, uh, but it's hard to get our hands on them, especially when the dosing frequency is going to probably be more frequent yeah. than what they're indicated for, for example, for psoriasis. Yeah. Do you have any pearls or tricks to get approval for more frequent dosing or to get your hands on drug because uh, i mean that that's really i mean certainly samples are one approach but that's not always so easy right. um have you come across any way to get insurance to pony up um which is of course one of our greatest problems with access these days right great question that's like hard weekly we've uh, uh, you know lots of hs patients come on tuesdays it's i think the bane of our residents existence but you know i think one it's important to write a really comprehensive note on those patients, because by the time they've come to see me, chances are they've tried adalimumab, and you know, and you can list everything. I send the papers, you know, the, the literature, if there is any to support what I want to try, and eventually, we can get it. We may not get it at the higher doses, but I think if you can get it even at the standard doses, so let's say, um, uh, secukinumab, if you get it, uh, sorry, uh, ustekinumab, even if you can get it covered for the standard doses, then, and you can show some benefit or no benefit, then you can go back and ask for the higher dose. So, but it's a lot of paperwork and a lot of time. But the other thing is, I think many HS patients, and certainly the ones who I tend to see, have these comorbidities. So I really try to delve into those comorbidities. So if you have inflammatory bowel disease, right, that's a way to get biologics. If you have psoriasis or you have arthropathy, so with arthropathy or frank arthritis, I'll send them to rheumatology, get their take on whether or not this is maybe HS related or maybe it's something else. Um, and sometimes that's one way to get it covered, especially if a rheumatologist kind of calls it an inflammatory arthritis, which is what it is. Um, so that's another way. I find that if you do an infusion, it's through a hospital. And so it's not in the pharmacy benefit, it's in their medical benefit. That could be better covered. Um, so infliximab. Um, some infusion centers will administer ustekinumab. And again, if you go through the infusion center, it doesn't go through their pharmacy. So just some tips and tricks. 
just wanted to make two more comments. One was regarding obesity. So I'm always encouraging patients to lose weight. Obviously, we're not trained in that. And it's important to partner with nutrition, although I don't feel that that works either. But um, but people have lost weight. So I have had people who've had gastric bypasses or really like just went the hard way and calorie counted, whatever. And their HS doesn't always get better. Um, so I think this this mantra that like obesity... Uh, by decreasing obesity, people will go down to like low BMIs. In fact, someone dropped so much weight, I worked them up for Crohn's. And the HS initially improved. And I was like, wow, this is a miracle we've been waiting for. And it didn't. Right. So, you know, I think that, that all these ideas we have that obesity is causing it, clearly there's something to the obesity, but maybe just like in psoriasis, the gene is triggering both. I right. think we need to look at that more carefully in studies. And then finally, I don't think any medical therapy works once you have tracks. Yep. period Absolutely. so what is your approach regarding surgery because i think we underutilize it obviously yep. everyone knows that but how do we get surgeons to do it because they're always kicking it back kicking the can back to us for medical therapy yeah. but the mer medical therapy is not doing anything when you have these horrific tracts and i have had use of map and all these drugs and it's still just mm -hmm. i think you know costing our health uh insurance a lot of money and not working yeah so to back to your first question about obesity so um i too thought that that was gonna be the holy grail. I have to say the patients with that axillary mammary inguinal subtype, if it's usually the other way around, if they gain 20 pounds, it just, the disease goes crazy. If they lose 20 pounds, I think it does get quieter, but that subtype, yeah. Um, but I sent, we, we also were co-located for a while with the bariatric surgery program at, at Hopkins. And so I sent a few patients to them and started seeing them back. Same thing, right? They, some of them got better initially and then the disease, like it just found another pathway uh, to, to rear its ugly head. But something that was interesting to me, when patients lost 100 pounds, let's say, they would have all this um, uh, redundant skin. And that skin would rub and create friction and they would get HS lesions there. And so the patients who had bariatric surgery and then had skin reduction, then overall did better. But of course the skin reduction was also removing the sinus tracts, right? So, um, but they, they seem to have fewer new lesions. So I don't know if we've looked carefully enough at the patients who've lost weight to see, you know, which of those is causing the HS, whether it's just friction or it's just their old sinus tracts that are still going, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the second question, surgery. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of, of surgery for HS in the right hands. So a surgeon who's unfamiliar with HS or unwilling or unable to really do a wide, deep excision uh, will just put the patient in a worse off position because then it's partially removed and they have all this inflammation and it's never going to heal. So I think you have to pick your surgeons really carefully. So there were, because we had this HS thing going at Hopkins, I met with a couple surgeons. One was a burn surgeon, uh, one, uh, they were all plastics. Um, yeah, two burn surgeons and a regular plastic surgeon who I would send patients to and get good reports back and I would see their results. And so I met with them and I said, do you want these patients? Right? One of the three said, heck no. And you know, the other two are like, sure. And so I, I still send patients to them. From DC, I send them to Baltimore. And, and I think it, it, it's a subspecialty. Um, and so, yeah, you have to find the right person. There's a surgeon at MedStar who's interested in HS, Dr. Jeffrey Shupp. Uh, so, yeah, so. He's, he's burn, he's a burn surgeon, he's a head, yeah. So we're gonna meet, I think in a couple of weeks and I think that might be our DC, cause he's interested and he wants to see, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's, and he's interested in the research side as well and they're also building a tissue bank. So he has a reason to do HS surgery. But the other thing is um, I like marsupialization. Um, and so, you know, uh, Jocelyn Kirby at Penn State she does something called punch marsupialization. So, you know, we have the usual marsupialization where you take off the entire top of the sinus tract. Works beautifully. Um, but punch marsupialization, she just puts a few punches along the tract, gets in there with a curette and scrapes it up. It's quick and dirty, and it tends to work. Maybe just kind of incites a healing, healing response. But so I try to do a little bit of that um, in clinic. So. I'm just going to speak on the, the surgical, surgical behalf. Um, 
as a surgeon, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. With HS, um, I, I think it's, a, it's you're doing a disservice to the patients by interacting with their own surgeons. I hate getting HS patient centered because I don't think we're capable of, of uh, handling exactly what you described. And I think all the destructive therapies for HS need to be utilized not within a, a vacuum, but that there has to be a plan from the beginning. And if you don't do that, you get your hands tied when you're approaching surgical disease. And so as a surgeon, taking a wide whack of an area is definitely the way to go. But you, you, know, you have to be comfortable going down to the axillary plexus yeah. um, and potentially dissecting around nerves. And as derm surgeons, when we get patient sent, we treat these like cysts essentially, and, mm. and, and they're not that, mm -hmm. that you really should avoid attempting to do that um, or even sending patients to have that done. That's, people will do that because they don't realize what the, what the tract is going, but you don't oftentimes see uh, some of the extension. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to marsupialize, I think it's important to work with a surgeon from the beginning so that they can plan for scarring the issues related to that and what may happen in the surgery because it makes the surgery really difficult after you have marsupialized recurrent repeatedly mm -hmm. over time in different areas. Mm -hmm. Um, that sometimes it's even better to say if we're going down that track and we have small or multifocal disease that, that a whack right then will do better in terms of putting in a skin graft and healing the wound because a patient who've had multiple scarring issues have no vascularization mm -hmm. and you put in a skin graft they fail and these, these turn to big problems, especially not in the underarm but in the groin mm -hmm. or um, a perianal area or things like that that make it very difficult from um, a sitting standpoint. So surgery I agree is totally great. The difficulty is that a lot of patients, you don't want to over-treat somebody and you don't know where they are on the spectrum and if they're going to have more diseases and, and kind of prophylactically or preventably um, take out a, a big mass. Um, whereas when you see individual lesions that may be recurrent and you feel like you can take out that one nidus, in my experience, it's all, it, it never is that one nidus and then you get these little tracks that come back and then you, you have your hands tied where you're taking out a big whack where you have potential nerve damage. Right. Um, so, so my point is, if, if you want to go to surgical group, work early and work with a, a general plastic surgeon who knows that anatomy and that disease process. Otherwise, um, you really it, it becomes difficult down the line um, without any treatment. Agreed. Thank you. Yes. You alluded to some uh, HS and GP overlap, and I was wondering if you commonly see that in your clinic. And if you have this kind of patient, are they more likely to have like follicular subtype or the auxiliary one? And if they're more responsive to certain treatment, I think in the literature, the most recent thing I've seen is Dr. Fink. I had a case series of about 13 patients back in 2010. So um, I'm not sure. If, I think it may be something worthwhile to look into it. Dr. Pacheco mentioned she has some cases. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, working on combining some cases from hospital center and Wake Forest has a HS clinic, and I think we have about 20, 30 cases. So oh. if any other DC programs have HS GP overlap patients, uh, we could increase that number and lead to a nice study. Yeah, no, thank you for telling us about that. That's, that's the way to answer these questions, right? It's to, to pool our patients. So um, I think that's a great idea to update the literature on that. Um, so in terms of the patients who have HS and PG, I think they generally have that syndromic subtype that I alluded to, um, where they tend to have HSPG um, and usually like arthropathy or kind of have systemic illness. They, they have malaise, they don't feel well. And so I tend to use more infliximab in those patients. I'm more likely to try anakinra in those patients, sometimes need systemic steroids. Um, they don't respond very well to surgery, obviously, right? They have PG, and so they're a really high-risk um, surgical candidate. So it's tough to treat, and like Dr. Friedman said, you kind of have to layer things on. So they may be on infliximab and cyclosporin, right, for, for infliximab and prednisone and cyclosporin just to get their PG under control. It's tough, tough disease. Thank you. Thank you.